All right, everyone, my name is Brian Davidson. I'm a delegate from Legislative District 16 in Ada County. And I got to uh, bring on our MC for tonight. I think uh, he's well known amongst conservatives and freedom fighters in the state of Idaho. He's a uh, four-term state lawmaker from Kootenai County. And uh, perhaps no one has put more on the line to fight the IRS than our MC tonight. So I'd like to introduce State Representative Phil Hart. Well, uh, thank you all for coming tonight. I remember uh, four years ago when we we had the state convention in in uh, Sandpoint. That was another presidential year. We we did this kind of event at, in Post Falls, and I think uh, I think back then we were all more novices and. We were pretty green at the process, but we, we had a lot of enthusiasm. And I think what's different about 2012 now from 2008 is a lot of us have more experience. We know the process. Some of us have a lot of battle scars, but I think we're in a position to really be more effective than we, we've been in 2008 and 2010. And so I really look forward to, to a good convention here. And I'm, I'm told that you've already had the, your prayer and, and you, we've already said the pledge. I, I got here a little bit late. I, I kind of got lost on my, my way to the hot springs. So we're going we're gonna to move right on to a, a special reading by uh, Jan Wimberly. So Jan, would you come on up? It's nice to see you all here tonight. I'm sitting right here. So you're standing on my speech right now. Sorry. I know that we're all very concerned about our country. And uh, I live on seven acres, which was part of the inspiration for this poem. It's entitled, The Tree. Is there any thin branch to save in time before a harsh winter? I see that the orchard is being destroyed by bugs that eat away slowly at their ill. Mostly unobserved until the tree is very sick. The protected bark has been intact many seasons, but now is mostly a facade. Little by little, through many a decade, the destruction under the surface has sometimes been observed. Both signs of light wood dust or a darkened, unfruitful branch now and then were disregarded by the busy, joyful caretakers. Such a strong tree will surely always be, and not need much help of me, they thought. And as they tended to other endeavors, and uh, hundreds of woodpeckers bashed their beaks year after year, and their feathered friends, hawkish flocks, filled the air against the tree's strong constitution. Until hardly recognizable as the tall, proud tree it once was, unique and breezes free, pieces of its own protection dismantled are being walked upon or forgotten and strewn about in healthy sculpture. The tree can no longer provide us a shelter or feed the hungry masses from the people store. Another danger also grave trees undermining could not stay. The muddy water seemed benign at first glance, no talk they sign, until they came in like a flood, polluting the tree's sap and blood, drinking in slow bone poison, well corrupted root foundation. How sad, how pitiful, the Denise of the beautiful that lived under spacious skies and waved its leaves and returned to amber waves of green. Generations used to climb its sturdy branches to vistas not seen from low ground. And they would marvel at purple mountain majesties. Are we sure there is no sapling romping precariously in the freedoms of its own childhood, coming up from the old root unafraid to live it in, which within itself has the makings of the former heritage, if given the time, attention, and proper support, 
being ever watchful of the history and frightening erosion that crumpled and collapsed. Could it provide a shelter once more and bring about a new bounty store? I have a little quote here from Nikita Khrushchev. We cannot expect the Americans to jump from capitalism to communism, but we can assist their elected leaders in giving Americans small doses of socialism until they suddenly awake to find they have communism. Thank you, Jan. You know, uh, the, the uh, Communist Party of the United States quit running candidates when they found uh, uh, what they wanted in, in a couple of mainstream party candidates. And so uh, so Jan is, is really right. You know, we sort of need to pinch ourselves and think critically about uh, about where we're going as a nation and uh, and what our founders gave us and, and how far we, we've drifted from there. Well, we're going to hear from uh, two folks who are running for state party chair. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Barry Peterson, and then we're going to hear from Galen uh, DeMora. De De and I apologize if I didn't pronounce that correctly. And we're not going to have a debate. We're, it's more of a forum. Each uh, candidate is going to make a, a statement. And then I'm going to ask them four questions that they will each answer. And, we're not gonna take any questions from the audience, but of course they'll be around and you can approach them individually and, and uh, talk to them about whatever your issue might be. So can we have uh, Barry Peterson? Is he here? says these questions are easy. I think I'd rather take on the audience. <laughs> there are many of you who don't know me, but I've been active in the party for right close to 30 years, first running as a candidate in my county for county commissioner where I served two terms. And then uh, a few years after that, where I began to work actively in the party as a precinct committee member. In time, I became the county chairman, and a little bit longer amount of time, why they allowed me to become the region chairman, where I have served for four years. So I've had occasion to be somewhat associated with the state party for half a dozen years, maybe a little bit more, and from uh, our county for the last 30 years. To show you my disposition, I was in high school at the time Barry Goldwater ran for president. And there was something about Senator Goldwater that immediately attracted my mind. And even though he didn't do very well as a presidential candidate, I thought he was unfairly treated as all the losers feel they are. Of course, and I was a loser because I was rooting for a loser. <laughs> Nonetheless, the ideals that he espoused found a root in my mind, and I anxiously courted them and have held on to them all my life. When I served as a county commissioner, uh, of course you serve with two others, and you only prevail on a decision if you get two of the three votes. But I'll never forget an incident when a, a fairly young woman came in and she wanted the county commissioner to assist her with her cost of living. And, of course, she had plenty of assistance from all the sources that are available. But when she asked for our county citizens who paid their taxes to assist her, I asked her some fundamental questions that were fundamental to me anyway. Do you have cable TV or satellite TV? Yes, I do. And she had some other things that I thought were a little bit extravagant if you don't have any money. And me, myself, I just watch TV from an antenna. But as she alluded to those things that she enjoyed, 
I commented to her that it would be difficult for me to spend my neighbor's tax money on her so that she could enjoy cable TV versus antenna TV. She said to me, Mr. Peterson, would you deny me this entertainment that I get to enjoy every day? Absolutely. I only use that as an illustration of, of where my roots are. I am for being self-reliant. It's in my heart that if you take something for nothing, you diminish your own character. If you do need assistance, there are lots of people, friends and neighbors, co-church members, uh, service clubs, they are anxious to help people who truly are in need. But if you're getting something for nothing and you make it a way of life, you, sub you substantially diminish your own character. If you diminish your own character, you diminish the members of your family's character as well. And before long, society is diminished. And you'll remember that it was President Lyndon Johnson who felt like everybody had to have more food or had a right to food, even though it wasn't the food, food that they had done anything to obtain. Now in our society, we've gotten the gamut from food to prepared meals to homes to transportation. It functions in every part of our society. And as we participate in those functions, whether it be in man tra mass transit that is heavily subsidized, or the school lunch program when you have a quarter in your own pocket, any time you take something for nothing, you are diminished. And that's what our society frequently asks of government. We ask for it at every level. It's common here to, at a meeting like this to think that we're speaking in terms of the national level. And certainly it's true at the national level. It's true at the state level. When I was a young lad, maybe about as... Uh, uh, in fact, I might have been a baby when Stan Clark was a young man. But in any regard, in our home, or in my hometown of Mountain Home, we had one part-time health and welfare worker who rented an office space that she used twice a week. And now we have a wonderful building and a number of employees in that building. And if they don't have enough people coming in to get assistance, they go search them out. This is but one function of our government and society has not been at it long enough that we make a demand, if you will, Maybe not you personally, but as a group, we all make a demand on government. We demand unemployment benefits. We demand food stamps if we are in trouble. Your cousins demand a house if they can't afford one. It's the society we are. And I have a sense, in mingling among you, that you have a fierce independence. That you're anxious to support yourself, and you realize the great character that comes from being self-reliant. And it's in you to expect that out of others. I don't know if we can write the ship. The poem was interesting to me from that standard, or from that standpoint. But nonetheless, that's the way it is. I want to talk a little bit about our presidential candidates, so I'm aware that most of you are supporters of, of Senator, uh, Representative Ron Paul. Yeah! By your, by your very nature, you are independent rascals. <laughs> It makes up a large percentage of the population of Idaho. Amen. But still, you're a part of the whole society. I was visiting with Dan a few minutes ago, and this observation came to my mind. Frequently in elections, 
The elections are decided by 1% or less. Maybe 51 to 49, 50 and a half to 49 and a half. Sometimes one vote, sometimes a tie vote, where we flip a coin to determine who will be the winner. When we had our caucuses this year in Idaho, we had four candidates on the ballot. If you're, I'm going to point at you because you're the closest guy to me. If your candidate got 321 votes, and my candidate got 320 votes, and I lose, do you want me to take my toys and go home? Or do you want me to join in, and as much as we're both Republicans, and come help you prevail against the common foe? The guy that we're out after is President Barack Obama. That's the guy we're really after. That's why we're working at this time. He is our objective, not as to win but as to lose him. And I hope that each and every one of us will gather around the candidate that's been elected from our party, 